So I asked Susan last night uh, what I should talk about, which is my new way of not having to go crazy trying to come up with a new topic, which I don't think there's any new topics left. And so she had this idea, and I thought, because of our conversation, I thought, well, that's pretty good. And then she had this really great idea for a little theater. And unfortunately, um, I, I didn't have my act together because uh, she said, well, you should wear the hat. There's the hat. See the hat? Yeah. You should wear the hat, and you should carry that, that thing with all the hair on it. And I went looking for the thing with all the hair on it, and I don't know where it disappeared to. Of course, I only have three now, so, but this, the, you know, I, I looked, not there. And, uh, and then I thought, well, yeah, and then after she left, we're laughing, you know, I said, so. Oh, where's the hat? Uh, this hat doesn't fit. Oh. I have, yeah, I do have a hat that fits, it's down in my room. <laughs> but Tree, Tree's brother picked up one of these hats. And that's a story in itself, because he came back, he was so happy, and he asked me to put, you know, he says, I have a hat for you. This is after he modeled it for everybody. And we know our tree, that he's got six of everything. And so he puts, you know, I go to put this hat on, and it sits right on top of my head like a little beanie. <laughs> and I said, well, tree, that's not going to work. And uh, he said, oh, it has to work. And I said, well, no, you have to get it to the size of your head. He says, no, there's only one size, which up until then I didn't realize that all people's head were the same size. But then I, I, he taught me something. So then a year later, he had another family member going to Vietnam. And he told me that. And I said, okay, well, I'll measure my head. So I measured my head with a little cloth tape measure, you know. And I told him in centimeters. And I don't remember what the measurement was. And he was so happy, he showed up a month later. And he's got another hat, because we have two of these up there. They're nice decorations. And uh, he says, here, this is whatever it was, 75 centimeters or something. So I go to put it on, and it, now it sits, it doesn't sit here, now it sits here. <laughs> and I go, it's not the right size. Oh, no. No, they were told that it was, let's, let's say it was 75 centimeters. And I said, well, it but it's not. Huh? It's 59. That was the measurement. 59. 59. So I said, well, and I got a tape measure out, and by golly, it was 58. <laughs> and uh, so then, then we have these two beautiful hats now, which we put up next to the Buddha, at the feet of the Buddha as decoration. And, but we know that the small one fits tree, and the large one, I had Vui Mung try it on, it fits him. So I told him, and I keep meaning to do this, Michaels has a sell on right now for frames, shadow box frames, and I, I intend to go over there and, and see if this, get a, a frame for it, and I'm going to put a card inside of it that says, uh, when Roshi dies, this goes to Tree, when Roshi dies, this goes to Vui Mung. So they'll both have a hat, but they don't get to wear a hat yet, they're not old enough to wear a hat. So. The idea was, and it would have been good theater, except I, I don't know if I had the nerve to do it, because uh, I actually have a hat that fits, that another student got me. And because I told him about the hats, and I thought it was pretty funny, and he said, whoa, what size is your head? And 59, I guess, and so he went, ordered one from Vietnam for me, which I'll show you someday, you know, after I've had a lot of apple cider or something. <laughs> Get it out, show it to you. Walk with the umbrella. Huh? We'll walk with the umbrella. Yeah, I have an umbrella too. Yeah. Yeah, Suhita gave me an umbrella years ago. Yeah, it's all put away. And uh, well, when I get old, when I get old, then you can, that's a big thing with monks, put an umbrella. So, yeah, that would have been great though, to come in with a hat on, and then I have the hosu, which is the fly whisk, so you don't kill flies, and, you know, the mark of an enlightened man and or an abbot. Okay? And all of these things. And the whole point of this was, I said, what should I talk about? And she said, dealing with titles and, and stuff like that, kind of. I don't remember exactly. What did you exactly say, Susan? Well, we were talking about how 
people put so much importance in things and titles and karate belts and all of that stuff. Right. And miss really the whole point. Okay, so you don't have a short title. She did it short last night. She said, talk about this. So, and, and we had originally talked about uh, levels. So the Japanese, and all Buddhism except Japanese, there are not all these different levels of being a monk. But in Japanese Buddhism, it's just the stairway to heaven that you keep going through all these little things. It's kind of like the martial arts now. When I was a kid and I started martial arts, there was a white belt, a green belt, a brown belt. That was it. And then there was a black belt. And now there's a white belt and an orange belt and a yellow belt and a purple belt and a green belt and a dark green belt and a brown belt and a, just, and a red belt and a red belt with a black stripe. And then it just goes on and on and on forever like that. So, kind of what she said is, because she didn't say that, we talked about that. But she said, and of course, nobody that's listening to me talking to this camera can hear what she said. But basically, she said, the, the difficulty of people that want titles and want recognition. And I, I was telling her, I had a student one time, because I've now had quite a few students, who uh, did his training with me. Um, and at the end of his obligatory five years training after becoming fully ordained, I asked him, what are you going to do now? And uh, since my primary job is to be a teacher of monks and lay people, that's a reasonable question to ask a monk who has finished his time of formal study with his teacher, who is now free to do whatever he wants to do. And in the Buddhist world, uh, I have a friend he has 11 monks and nuns around him, and they don't plan on going anywhere. They stay very busy. They don't just sit around the temple reading books, you know. They, they have all kinds of social work they do and things. And they stay with this master because I personally feel he's enlightened. And I think they think that too, and they stay with him because uh, he's, a, he's a good teacher just by being 87 years old and uh, keeping him going. And, um, but at the end of five years, you can, you could, uh, you're free unless there's a problem. Like sometimes somebody can't take care of themselves, but they were allowed to become a monk. And then they probably would not travel because they can't take care of themselves. So I said to him, what are you going to do? And he kind of looked at me with a blank stare. And uh, I said, you know, you could stay here and help me. You know, I can, I can give you more responsibility, or you could go study with another teacher, you know, to feel you need to be rounded out. Or you could go on like a pilgrimage where you visited different temples. And uh, the little nun that visited us this morning uh, has been a novice for four years now, and she was talking about going and visiting other temples, so she saw how they did things, you know. and. Uh, Recently, as you all know, I was gone last week because I was on a fundraising tour, which took me three days to recover from <laughs> until I felt normal again. Because I did 10 or 12 temples a day, and it just wiped me out. You know, I'd get home about 9 o'clock at night, just ready to fall down. And so I told him that. I said, you could go visit other temples. I said you could get involved with social work. I went through a whole list of things, you know. But I told him, you have to think about what it is you want to do. But I said, you're always welcome here, you know. And uh, so he came back later that same retreat. And uh, we talked a little bit. He wasn't sure what he wanted to do. And so he had done some koans with me, some Zen problems, and solved them. And so I gave him what I thought was another little, a very simple, straightforward koan. I said to him, while you're deciding what you want to do, you need to look at why it's so important to you to have a title. And from the very beginning, it was important to him. It was important in his life. He was a very intelligent and kind man. Uh, 
he was uh, college educated, uh, you know, graduate school, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I thought of this morning when I was thinking about him that he was the first person I ever knew that repeatedly said, well, when I was in graduate school, you know, we have, we have <coughs> a self-effacing Donna staying with us for this month or year, decade, mm -hmm. and Donna's been coming, you know, the, the, if you don't know, Donna, this lady back here is the one that painted that beautiful picture. And uh, on another talk, I made our cameraman turn the camera to the picture so people know what I was talking about. But until Donna came to stay this time, because she never really stayed here before, she lived lived up in here and visited us every week and did all kinds of neat stuff, but she never lived at the temple. Now she lives at the temple, and I found out I never knew anything about her. Really, not really. She had lots of secrets. And I found out, well, she's got a... A, a bachelor's in English literature. I never knew that. I, I knew that, you know, some of the things she did early in life. And then she's teaching college courses and she doesn't, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. She tells me this and and next thing I know, she's got a master's in English literature. Who would know? You know, she's just average everyday Donna. You know, she doesn't take herself too seriously, right? But this one student who I love to death, but all the time, it, it was almost like name dropping, you know. You know when uh, William Bendix and I, we were having lunch there at the Hollywood uh, Brown Derby, you know, you know those kind of people, and yeah, I, I, I knew him, you know, Eric Clapton, uh, I have one of his signature guitars, but we also went out for a, a Reuben sandwich, you know, like anybody would really care, right? And he kept, he kept saying that. It was repeating. And I, he even got me saying it sometimes. I thought, well, that gives you a time reference. Well, I, when I was in graduate school and I got average three to four hours sleep a night, and I was a zombie all the time. So I said to him, I want you to think about why it's so important that you have a title. And he went to go home with the folks because they all lived in L.A. and they were coming up here for retreats. He got in that car. This was reported to me because I have spies everywhere, by the way. If you, if you talk against me, I'm told. And I was told he got in that car. That car wasn't even rolling down the road. And he said, Roshi said, I have an inferiority complex. That was his interpretation of that. And I never really thought he had an inferiority complex. I thought it, titles were important to him. One doesn't necessarily lead to the other. Well, you know, we say, we, said, we say people are ambitious. Well, who's ambitious? Donald Trump's ambitious. Hillary Clinton's ambitious. They just had this acrimonious, God, I've never used that word before. I think I'm using it right, acrimonious encounter for the last year calling each other names, right? Didn't they? Yes, they did. Was either of them nice to the other? No. And what did they want? They wanted a title. I mean, they wanted to be President of the United States. And we don't ever, you know, we usually we don't think, well, they're a bad person because they want to have the, the most powerful position in the whole world. That's the way I look at it. We just say they're ambitious. Right? We just say they're ambitious. So what's the difference? Well, I ask him, why is it important? You know, I think uh, I had a lot of respect for Jack Kennedy. Unfortunately, he got assassinated very early in the game. But he didn't need any money. I don't know that he needed the power, but I think his dad, whatever your opinion is, I think his dad told his sons, you have all the money that you could ever have, and you ought to make your life about service to this country. I believe that. And I think that Jack Kennedy, that's why he ran for Congress and then he became president, is the idea of helping the country. I wish I could believe that about Donald Trump. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why he's president, to tell you the truth. You know, maybe it was just one more thing to do. But ambition. People come to the practice of Zen and they have an ambition to become awakened. 
And of course, I have to spend all my time uh, trying to overcome that idea they have of becoming awakened. Because as long as you're reaching for that elusive notion of becoming awakened, they'll never achieve it. It's the paradox of Zen. It's the first and most important paradox of Zen. If you want to become awakened, you can't become awakened because you're tied down and slave to the idea of becoming awakened. So it's much easier to do our practice so that you can be happy. Because I think every human being wants to be happy. So it's, that's, not, that's not such a strange thing, you know. And if, if uh, you were walking over to our meditation hall with uh, two or three other people and one of them said, so how you doing in there? <laughs> Did you have an awakening? And you go, no, but I'm pretty happy. That's a good answer. Because the awakening, well, it'll happen. And when it happens, you're happy. Because you can have a title and not be tied to the title. And if the title's taken, and here's how you tell whether a title is, is, has the wrong importance to someone. If I take it away from you, how do you feel? Okay, do you start questioning your self-worth? You, you know, do you start, do you have to go look and find out who you are? I love that. Well, you, you 22-year-old movie star or 24-year-old country singer. So what are you doing? Well, I'm on the journey to discover myself. Really? <laughs> I had somebody tell me that once, and I took the stick and I went, whack! And I said, did you figure out where you were? You hit me! And I go, yeah, but is, did you figure out where you are? You're right there. There is no discovering yourself. You're right there. There are a lot of times is get over yourself, but you're always with yourself. But this thing of titles, as you get older in the practice of Zen, and it applies to monks and it applies to lay people. I used to watch people comparing their achievement. And I, when I started as a teacher, I realized that I needed to address this. And one of the things is that 22-year-old that goes into the meditation hall, who's been doing yoga for the last five years, and wraps their legs up into a full lotus, and sits there like a stone, which is, by the way, what we're supposed to do, without moving and wiggling and <laughs> funny breathing patterns, you know, and all of this. What are you doing? <laughs> I'm raising my chakra. <laughs> you know, all of that stuff going on, just sit there quietly. <laughs> And then, then somebody comes along and they go, now there's a real meditator. That person's got it together. Look at that form. You know, you've seen it on the fronts of books about Zen. Look at that form. Oh, they must be so close to awakening. And yet the reality is everything's easy. And we don't make discoveries about ourselves or the world through easy I know it disappoints you, but we don't do it with easy, okay? What are you capable of? What are you physically capable of? When I came out of the service, I came out with a couple ideas. One that all draft dodgers ought to have to do government service, okay? I didn't have a problem with the fact that they didn't want to go to war. I had a problem with the fact that they didn't want to do anything for anyone. So, this is 1966, I came back from the war, and I said, Canada is not an option. Why don't we have them work in the inner city? Why don't we have them work with the forest rangers taking care of the forest? They don't have to go shoot people, but everybody should do, like in Israel, everybody should do a couple years of service to the community. <clears throat> oh, I was not a popular guy. <laughs> okay, no. that. That didn't go over real well. So you look in there and you see someone, they're sitting really good, and you think, okay, they've accomplished something. Well, how about the person that goes in there and struggles? Lots of people struggle. 
when I started sitting with, I had done yoga for a long time, I could sit in a full lotus for four minutes, five minutes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'd be watching the clock. Okay, that's it. And I go sit with a Zen master, and I'd break into a cold sweat every time I went to sit. I mean, this is just sitting in a half lotus. My legs went to sleep. Everything from my waist down went to sleep. I'm just, and I could just barely stand the pain. But I kept going. Because the other thing I thought people should have to experience is what they're capable of. You don't know until you have to confront it how much pain you can deal with. You don't know how much discomfort you can deal with. You don't know how much you can do without until you try. And we are, in my opinion, this is not the Buddha's opinion, the most spoiled people in the entire world. There are places that think that we're just the most arrogant people in the world because we're so wealthy. We're wealthy with rest. We're wealthy with time off. We're wealthy with televisions. We're wealthy with the McDonald's. There are lots of places. Francisco? Everybody go fast food in Mexico? No. Yeah. Nobody has money for that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. But here, kids. Kids are in buying a snack, you know. I used to teach this class, and these kids, they'd say, after school class, and the kids would go, well, we got to get something to eat. And I'd go, oh, okay. Well, you know, be back in 20 minutes. They'd come back with McDonald's, a big bag of McDonald's. You know, they, they ate like Rob used to eat. They'd have two or three hamburgers in there. <laughs> I'm serious. And I'm looking at these. I go, is that your dinner? No, no, that's my snack. <laughs> Where else in the world are kids eating hamburgers as snacks? Okay, so we have enormous wealth. And we're spoiled. And we don't know what we're capable of. I came back from Vietnam and I needed nothing. Not because I was a saint, because I found out what was necessary in life. I used to drive everybody else crazy. I had girlfriends. They didn't understand why, you know, I, I didn't have to have a lot of money. You don't need a lot of money to exist. You need common sense. You know, you can go buy 10, you used to be able to buy 10 pounds of potatoes for a buck and a half. You know how long you can eat on 10 pounds of potatoes? A long time. <laughs> yeah. I used to make this big pot of potato soup. Okay. But no, no. Well, we have to have something different all the time. So I thought that everybody should have the wonderful experience of finding out what they're capable of. I had that experience when I was young. I was 18 years old, and I went to paratrooper school. And over 500 of us started off in the class, and we ended up with 240. And I watched these great, big, strong guys. I wasn't a big, strong guy. I was 150 pounds. Can you believe me? hundred? Yes, it's true. <laughs> and I did more push-ups than you can even count and ran everywhere. And what I found out was don't give up. I found out you people, if I was capable of it, you're capable of it. As long as you don't give up, you can achieve it. The minute you give up, it's over with. So you want to be happy? Don't give up. You want to be awakened? Don't give up. But you can't, you can't re, you know, don't reach for that ring. Many masters have been asked, why do you sit? Why do you do meditation? To do meditation is the answer. No, no, no. What, what's, what's your goal? To do meditation. What a marvelous idea. Why do you wash dishes? Just to wash dishes. There's no other activity going on then the quality of the activity all of a sudden becomes the activity of Buddhas. It rises up to that level. As long as you're doing what you're doing. You guys, you missed it. You see our new barn? How many of you notice a new barn? Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, okay. There's the man. All you gotta do is... <laughs> <laughs>
But you know what? All you have to do is watch Rob work. I, you know, I think Rob gets diluted. We all get diluted in some activities. But when you watch him work, that's all he's doing. He's working. Nobody can move that fast and think everything to death. He knows what he's going to do before he starts doing it. Right, Rob? You've got it all. I, I work the same way, but that's because I'm old and senile. I have to visualize everything or I just mess everything up. But he just, from the first time I ever saw him doing anything, it's just boom. He knows what he's doing. I you know, stand back so I don't get hurt. <laughs> I move so fast. But in the process, sometimes there's, there's a distractor. And the distractor is a title. Isn't that neat? Put that on your head and all of a sudden you're an important person. Put it out. It won't fit. That's what I said. This one doesn't fit. Um, I have a friend. I've known him. I don't have any idea how old this monk is. But when Watung Manjak passed away, uh, then somebody had to take his place. And I thought for a long time this monk did. But he's, he's old. I don't know, 85, 90 years old, something like that. And I've known him for a very long time. And a couple of years ago, I went to a ceremony, a memorial ceremony, and he had one of these hats. And he had it in a, in a folder, you know, like, a, like a, a manila folder. And he waited until it was time for him to go up, you know, how we do here. And we do the incense offering, and I call on the Buddhas. And he took the hat out of the folder, and he put it on his head. And he did all of that. And the minute the ceremony was over with, he took that hat off, and he put it back in there. Because he was very self-conscious of wearing that hat. Now, he'd been qualified to wear that hat for about 30 years. But there is that sense of self-importance that some people pick up. And that monk was smart. He stayed away from that hat as long as he could. And then people said, you've got to wear the hat. You're the oldest monk here. That's usually how it's done. You're the oldest monk. You've got to wear the hat. And so he wore the hat. Okay? Up until this fashion statement, <laughs> see this fashion, this, this a few years ago become common in Vietnam that the monks started wearing this kind of, kind of gold color. I have a number of robes this color now because I have a disciple who's very good to me. He has a temple in Washington and when he orders robes, he orders a set for me. And all of a sudden I'm this really wealthy guy with all these robes. And I can't pass these along because these kind of imply that you've been a monk for a while. <coughs> you know, so but high, it's going to be a few years before he can wear this color of robe. <laughs> all right? But when I became a monk, everybody wore a brown robe. There was no other color that was common. The Chinese, they wore robes like this. This is where they got the idea from the Chinese. But everybody wore a brown robe. So how do you tell who's the high guy? How do you know? What they're wearing. Yeah, yeah, hat, that's about it. So I'll ask you another question. Any, any recovering Catholics here? <laughs> Any recovering Catholics? No recovering Catholics? Oh, well, if you were a recovering Catholic, I would ask you the question, which I'm going to ask anyway, is how do you know who the mother superior? I love nuns. I just like the outfit. I would die if I had to wear all of those clothes, the old outfit they wore. But how do you know who the mother superior is? Did you see the nun story? I saw it six times. <laughs> Yeah, was it Audrey Hepburn? I thought she made such a wonderful nun. But how do you know who 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 the head nun is? It's got to be the hat. How do you know? Huh? Hat. You don't? No. Behavior. Behavior. There you go. Behavior. In in a nun story, which I saw first when I was in high school, I was so impressed with that. I knew what my vocation was going to be. They wouldn't let me be a nun, so I had to become a monk. <laughs> but the mother superior never sat back in her chair. She never sat back against the chair because she knew that was bad posture. And it affected, she must have had Zen training because now you have a hard time breathing. She always sat at the front of the chair. And I noticed that. I noticed that she never sat back and got into bad posture. Have you ever seen a movie about monks? 
you know, Cat I'm talking Catholic monks, but there are, yeah. there are Anglican monks, yeah. How do you tell the abbot? Behavior. Okay, Catholic monks and nuns don't have any particular thing they wear that shows you who they are. Now, you go to a Buddhist monastery, how do you know that I'm the Roshi? Here, forget about the color of the robe because every, everybody's wearing this color now. You know, trees got robes this color. Of course, trees got robes every color. But how do you know who the abbot is? The Avery of the Sangha. Yeah, yeah. So, and why is that? Because we're human. And if we start giving people yellow belts and orange belts and green belts and red belts and all these belt belts, and we start putting all these designations on them, they're going to start taking that serious. And the next thing you know, they go, well, shoot, I get to wear this hat. See, I can wear this hat. It'll probably be another 15 years before I'm, I'm not embarrassed to put one of these hats on them. But you start doing this stuff, and then you start taking yourself seriously, and then you've got to start all over again. <laughs> it's, it's like an alcoholic that falls off the wagon. you got to go back and earn your first chip again. Because, you know, you took that drink, that drink of self-importance. So you have to continuously remind yourself to not believe your press. To not believe, you know, people come up and they say how wonderful you are and everything. And that's nice. I like it that you like me. That's, that's a lot better than you don't like me. But you cannot get into the trap of thinking just because you've done this a while that that makes you so much better than somebody else. Because all of the really strong meditators I've known in my life struggled like crazy. They went into that meditation room, that, that meditation hall, and they worked on themselves. They worked on the fact that, that they were abused as a child. They worked on the fact that they belonged to a 12-step program. They worked on the fact that they had an illness like Susan has, that Susan, you know, she's not getting more well physically, but she is, I, the changes I've seen in her mentally Rob's shaking his head. He knows. He's watched him. Susan is my hero when it comes to dealing with a bad situation. What do you do when you have a bad situation? You accept it and move through it. And don't give up on life. That's what you do. You know. So, the point of this talk is, don't ever make the mistake of taking yourself too seriously. Because every time we sit down and begin to meditate, we should be a beginner. And every time we wash dishes, we should be a beginner. And every time we bow to someone, we should bow with the heart of a beginner.